In Hollywood, a dead man isn't who he appears to be, and someone just walked away with a million dollar insurance benefit. Now, forensics must prove that murder was part of the package. A police officer kills his wife in a freak car accident. But investigators believe he may have been driven to homicide. A simple farmer stands accused of murdering his brother, and a town rallies to his defense. So does forensic science. They look death in the face every day of their lives. That's from fragments of bone, drops of blood, and slivers of tissue, they can piece together the shattered circumstances that bring the deceased to their labs. Everybody has a story to tell, and each is a page in the coroner's casebook. When someone dies, their work begins. Coroners, medical examiners, and criminalists know that every kind of death leaves its subtle mark. And they know murder when they see it. Early in the morning of April 16, 1988, the Glendale, California 911 dispatcher received a call about a man in cardiac arrest. The call was placed by Dr. Richard Boggs, a respected neurologist. When paramedics arrived at his office, he explained that the man was one of his patients named Gene Hansen, who had a history of heart trouble. The victim had credit cards in Hansen's name. Before he called 911, Dr. Boggs said he'd done all he could to revive his patient, but nothing worked. Gene Hansen was declared dead at the scene. At the L.A. County Coroner's Office, the body was given a routine autopsy. The office sees 200 bodies each day, and this one was just another face in the crowd. Seeing no immediate cause of death except for a few marks on the heart, the coroner deferred to the diagnosis of the victim's personal physician, Dr. Boggs. Hansen's cause of death was listed as heart failure due to a dangerous heart condition. The body was released to the hands of John Hawkins, Hansen's companion and his partner in their successful sportswear business. He flew to California from Ohio to claim the remains. He had them cremated in respect for Hansen's last request. Hawkins, as his partner's sole beneficiary, then received the first million of Hansen's $1.5 million life insurance policy. Usually, that would be the end of the story. But this story was just getting started. Five months after the death, an insurance agent was closing Hansen's file when she noticed something strange. The face on Hansen's autopsy photo didn't resemble the photo supplied by the Department of Motor Vehicles. To double check, she requested that the thumbprint on file at the DMV be compared with the one from the autopsy. No doubt about it. These were two different men. And that raised two vital questions. Where was the real Hansen? And who was the dead man? The agent had uncovered something a lot more serious than insurance fraud. Though they're situated next to each other, the difference between Glendale, California and North Hollywood is like night and day. But this is where Glendale police went to solve the mystery of the dead man who wasn't Gene Hansen. 
Police determined from fingerprints and missing persons reports that the man was really a bookkeeper named Ellis Green. He was last seen leaving a bar in North Hollywood on April 15th. The next day, he was declared dead under an assumed name in Dr. Boggs's office. Sergeant John Perkins of the Glendale Police tried to sort out what happened. A photograph of Ellis Green's body that was depicted in the, in the doctor's office was taken to his elderly aunt, and that photo was shown to her. She identified that as being Ellis Green, her nephew. Now we knew we had the real body, the real name, but we still didn't have a, an exact or approximate cause of death. Demonstrating how Green died was only half the task before him. Investigators also had to prove that the real Gene Hansen was still alive. By now, months had passed. If Hansen were alive, he had an enormous head start to find a hiding place. John Hawkins, his partner in this elaborate insurance scam, had also vanished along with one million dollars of insurance money. Michael Barton, John Perkins, Police concentrated on the last hey, person to see the victim alive, Dr. Boggs. Hello, officers, I'm Dr. Boggs. What can I do for you? Detective. Police paid a visit to him to find out about the man who died in his office. Boggs told them that he'd been a patient for years. Boggs knew him only as Melvin Eugene Hansen, or Gene. He had no reason to suspect it was an assumed name. Faced with a search warrant, he handed over his patient's files. Sergeant Perkins examined them. It was possible that Dr. Boggs was telling the truth. Gene Hansen's records showed that he'd been repeatedly warned about his condition, but refused to follow doctor's orders. But it was also possible that Dr. Boggs was in on this elaborate insurance scam, and the records themselves were doctored. Perkins pulled three EKG strips dated several months apart. He wondered if they truly demonstrated the life-threatening heart condition that supposedly killed Green. He asked a cardiologist to analyze the EKGs. The heart specialist told him that they indicated a mild, common condition that wasn't fatal. Perkins was more suspicious than ever that Dr. Boggs had intentionally faked the records but he couldn't prove it. Then he found the answer was right on the EKG strips, simple enough for even a layman to understand. Late one night, I was uh, sitting at my desk and I'm looking at these, at these EKG strips and I'm going through them and I'm looking at them and suddenly it, it became very obvious. One was, uh, was completely clean. One had a, a red dye halfway down the length of, of the EKG strip, and the other one had a complete dye from the entire length of the EKG strip. And you suddenly think, wait a minute, these are all connected. So I put them up on the desk and put them end to end, and sure enough, the fractures matched perfectly. The red markings signaling the end of the roll formed one continuous darkening line across two of the three strips, allowing Perkins to put them into sequential order. But when he did so, the dates that Boggs wrote on the back of the strip were out of order and months apart. Uh, these were fabricated EKG strips. While Perkins was making his discovery, the case was progressing on a different front. Police were following the trail of Ellis Green's credit card purchases. The dead man's cards were still active and still in use. Investigators weren't sure who was using them, but they hoped it was the real Gene Hansen. They tracked the card to a bungalow on Key West, Florida. The rental agent confirmed that the tenant was a man named Ellis Green. 
He had moved out weeks earlier, and the apartment hadn't been rented since. Detectives looked for any clues that could reveal the identity of the former occupant. On a glass in a cabinet, they found one, a fingerprint. It matched Gene Hansen's. Now they had proof that he was alive. Then, in January 1989, nine months after his reported death, Gene Hansen, traveling under another assumed name, was stopped at the Dallas-Fort Worth airport returning from Mexico. He'd been acting eccentrically enough for customs agents to pull him over and inspect his suitcases. They found $14,000 in cash that he failed to declare, thereby breaking the law. They also found the IDs for 13 people. Among them was Ellis Greens, the dead man in Dr. Boggs's office. Here was proof that he'd switched identities with the victim and pocketed some of his own death benefits. He was arrested. With Gene Hansen captured and the incriminating EKG strips, police had enough to arrest Boggs as well. They knew they had him for conspiracy to commit insurance fraud. In fact, they uncovered evidence that he and Hansen had pulled off some fraudulent claims in the past. The two of them, along with John Hawkins, staged car accidents for the insurance money. Dr. Boggs was the physician who signed off on their medical claims. But was there enough evidence to prove that Boggs actually murdered Ellis Green as part of the conspiracy? Without a body, they didn't seem to have much of a case. Boggs claimed that they originally hoped to steal a body from the morgue, but that proved impossible. Then, by gruesome coincidence, the conspirators said they happened upon Ellis Green's body shortly after he died. Despite how unlikely the story sounded, Boggs challenged the prosecution to prove he was lying. Glendale Police Sergeant John Perkins had to somehow turn an elaborate insurance scam into a case of homicide. Gene Hansen, the man who faked his own death, and Richard Boggs, the accommodating physician, were already in custody. Perkins was eager to put all the pieces together and wrap it up, but there was still no sign of John Hawkins, the beneficiary who fled with the million-dollar insurance payout. And still, investigators were short on evidence to prove what they strongly suspected, that Dr. Boggs murdered Ellis Green to pass him off as Gene Hansen. We really needed somebody who could look at the uh, entire pieces of evidence that we had, that being uh, the autopsy report, some of the tissues. Uh, there was a stomach content that was collected at, at, at the time of autopsy. And, and examine those from an independent view to look at the crime scene photos to give us some indication as to this person did not die of natural causes. And that's when we brought in Dr. Michael Bodden. Michael Bodden is the executive director of the New York State Police Forensic Science Unit. He's also an expert on the nuances that death leaves on the body. He has worked on the congressional committees that investigated the deaths of John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King, Jr. In the case of Ellis Green, Bodden had slides of his heart, lung, and liver tissue, as well as photographs of the victim that were taken shortly after death. From this evidence, Baden could determine two facts with confidence. One, Green did not have a fatal heart condition. And two, his skin, which showed no other marks, was blue at the time of death, suggesting lack of oxygen. From these two facts, Baden reached a single conclusion. Green was suffocated. Except for the telltale blue color, 
In the absence of a struggle, suffocation leaves no marks. Its diagnosis comes from eliminating all other possible causes of death. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. A bullet wound, we don't need a diagnosis of exclusion because we find a hole in the body. Um, a stab wound or a uh, blow from a baseball bat all leave marks on the body that we can see at autopsy. But if something is put over the nose and mouth, causing a person to die because he or she can't breathe, and then that object is removed, a hand or a pillow, at the autopsy there's no specific finding that's going to say that he was suffocated. The evidence was enough to convince a jury that the three men had planned the crime together and that Dr. Boggs, the healer, was Dr. Boggs, a killer. These three individuals were not strangers to crime. Uh, they had hooked up uh, probably uh, four years before this particular murder, and they had uh, worked out different ways of committing insurance fraud. And the plan that they evolved was somebody had to die. That person, they agreed, was to be Gene Hansen. And the only way that they could pull this thing off was with a doctor, and that doctor was Dr. Boggs. Police believe that Boggs picked Ellis Green up at a bar, the last place he had been seen. He bought him some drinks to make him more compliant. The victim's blood alcohol content was well above the legal limit. Then, Boggs lured him to his office. Just in case the victim was still sober enough to fight back, Boggs may have incapacitated him with a stun gun. Then the victim was smothered without putting up a fight. Perkins believes that the forensic pathologist's determination of murder made this case winnable. Dr. Bodden's testimony in this particular case, I feel, was, uh, was that uh, uh, last inning, uh, you're down by two, uh, uh, and bases are loaded, and Dr. Bodden came in and basically hit a home run for us. In 1990, Richard Boggs was found guilty of first-degree murder and fraud. He was sentenced to life without possibility of parole. It took three years and a worldwide manhunt before police caught up with John Hawkins on the island of Sardinia. In 1995, both he and Melvin Eugene Hansen were convicted of fraud, grand theft, and conspiracy to commit murder. Hansen was given life without parole. Hawkins received 25 years to life. The work of the medical examiner undermined the murderous conspiracy of Gene Hansen and his cohorts. But whether a crime is ingenious or devilishly simple, the forensics required to solve it is equally complex. rainy night of November 27, 1992, just after 9.30 p.m., a passing motorist reported what looked like an accident on Hawaii's Volcano Highway. Police arrived to find a van facing the wrong way, apparently after spinning. The responding officer recognized the owner of the van to be Ken Matheson, a sergeant on the police force. Ken was badly shaken up. His wife, Yvonne, fared much worse. Ken had tended to her in the back of the van until help arrived. She had lost a lot of blood. By strange coincidence, Yvonne Matheson was a nurse who helped deliver the responding officer's first child weeks before. Paramedics moved her into the ambulance to rush her to the hospital at Hilo. she worked became the place where she died.
When Ken Matheson's fellow officers heard about the incident on the police radio, they went to see him at the hospital. Matheson told one of his colleagues that his wife's death was a terrible accident. She was driving the van when they started to fight. Things escalated. Enraged beyond reason, Ivan jumped out of the open window of the moving van. Ken said he slid over to steer the vehicle, then backed up to look for his wife. That's when he ran over her. Ivan and Ken Matheson had once been divorced, but then decided to give their marriage a second chance. It seemed to be working this time, give or take the usual rough spots. Then this tragedy destroyed it all. According to Hilo police, any accident that results in death is considered negligent homicide. For this misdemeanor, Matheson could expect a maximum fine of $1,000 and a year in jail. At the least, he'd be fined $100 or be sentenced to 100 hours of community service. In any case, he'd be able to keep his badge. He didn't protest the charges. As in any sudden death, a complete investigation would have to be conducted. It was a formality. The death of Ivan Matheson was unfortunate and tragic, but police had no reason to doubt Ken's story. While the investigation was underway, Matheson stayed on active duty with the police force. But after inspecting the scene of the accident, Hawaii County Police noticed some minor inconsistencies between the roadside evidence and Matheson's story. At first, they seemed hardly worth mentioning. Each year, tourists flock to Hawaii to escape the cares of their daily lives. The sun, the surf, and the primal fiery beauty of the volcanoes exert their cleansing influence. For Hawaii's inhabitants, life in paradise goes on just like anywhere else. Crimes are committed, accidents happen, and investigators are charged with determining which is which. In Hilo, Traffic investigators inspected the area where the wife of Sergeant Ken Matheson lost her life. They found relatively little blood on the highway compared to what was found in the van. Though it was a little peculiar, they wrote it off to the rain and the fact that Ken Matheson had rushed his dying wife into the van after he struck her. At the police impoundment lot, the van had its own story to tell. It was routine procedure for a vehicle involved in a fatal accident to undergo a mechanical inspection. It negates any future defense claims of faulty equipment. Police also had to be sure the van was safe to drive before they could release it to Matheson. Because of the nature of this accident, the undercarriage was thoroughly inspected. Hawaii County Police Traffic Investigator Martin Elazar was surprised by the relative lack of damage he found there. However, when he was done inspecting the outside, the interior of the van caught his interest. I peered inside from the outside and I could see blood stains. Blood stains on the driver's side window, blood stains on the plastic cover to the panel area fronting the steering wheel. Blood stains up above there was a heavy concentration of blood and hair on that bolt. There was no reason for blood to be in the driver's portion of the vehicle. Elazar needed a closer look, but to search inside the van required a warrant. 
he asked Deputy Attorney General Kurt Spohn to request one. The warrant came through in the nick of time. Three months had passed since the incident. According to Spohn, their main piece of evidence almost slipped through their fingers. You do a mechanical inspection, and once all the mechanical inspections and the search warrants are finished, you return the van to the owner. And in this case, uh, the van was authorized to be returned to the owner. Fortunately, Matheson hadn't picked it up yet. The van was secure. The release authorization was canceled. A search warrant for the van's interior was issued. Now, Spohn had to face the dismal possibility that Sergeant Matheson's story might be a lie. And though they still had the van, another piece of vital evidence was lost forever. We decided that this case was um, possibly more than a negligent homicide. And because of that, we decided we should probably have a forensic pathologist do an autopsy in this case. Um, however, at that time, we found out that the body had been cremated. Yvonne Matheson's body had been autopsied three days after her death. On the island of Hawaii, the coroner is also the chief of police. A pathologist from a nearby hospital is retained as a consultant. The pathologist was told that the death was accidental. But a pathologist specializes in natural causes of death, such as disease. Even so, he could tell that the victim's injuries didn't jibe with Ken Matheson's account. The pathologist noted injuries to the victim's head, arms, and hands that weren't consistent with being run over or tumbling out of the vehicle. But the interpretation of these injuries lay outside the scope of the consulting pathologist's training. It was really a job for a forensic pathologist who specializes in death by unnatural causes. Still, puzzled by his findings, the pathologist was sure to photograph every aspect of the victim and to take tissue samples. Now that the victim had been cremated, they were all that was left. A tragic accident case was now turning ugly. Spohn knew there was enough cause to open a homicide investigation, but without a body, there might not be enough evidence to resolve it. The original pathologist's photos and the evidence from the van would have to be enough he braced himself for the inevitable public outcry. In some ways, it's kind of a no-win situation. Um, if you investigate and find out that the police officer is innocent and you announce that, everybody says, well, it's swept under the rug because this is a police officer. And if you investigate the case and you find out that the officer is guilty and you charge him, everybody says you're only charging him because you're buckling under to public pressure and he's actually innocent. Sure enough. Six months into the investigation, widespread criticism forced Sergeant Ken Matheson's superiors to put him on desk duty while he remained a suspect. The press coverage brought to light an intriguing incident. A witness who read about the case in the papers told investigators that on the night of the accident, he stopped to help shortly after 9 p.m. As he pulled over, a man, possibly Ken Matheson, stepped from the back of the van and shined a flashlight in his eyes. He told the Samaritan that no one was injured and that the police had already been called. Then he sent him away. Investigators now suspected that perhaps the passerby interrupted the crime in progress. They just had to prove it. In Hawaii, Deputy Attorney General Kurt Spohn faced the unhappy task of investigating Sergeant Ken Matheson for murder. To find out more about the blood spatter in the driver's area of Matheson's van, 
he asked a colleague to locate the best blood spatter expert in the country. A couple of days later, he told me that it was someone by the name of Dr. Henry Lee, who was the uh, head of the Connecticut State Forensics Laboratory. Henry Lee, who is now commissioner of the state's Department of Public Safety, uses the laws of physics to uphold the laws of justice. His expertise is reading clues written in blood. That's called medium velocity. He's not afraid to get his hands dirty in the process. Like any substance, blood is affected by gravity and momentum. Every kind of bloodshed leaves behind characteristic clues. Stabbing will create a dripping pattern. The relatively low velocity of the weapon doesn't propel blood too far from the source. A speeding bullet, on the other hand, creates a bloody mist. And a bludgeoning wound produces large spatters that can spray far. By examining the tiny tails behind each drop of blood, Lee can determine the position of the victim and the amount of force used to create the injury. From this, and from the size of the wound, he can determine the type of weapon used and deduce the circumstances of a person's death. Lee is perhaps most famous for his work on the O.J. Simpson trial. He's also helped identify victims in mass graves in Bosnia. As soon as Lee received the photos taken from the Matheson case, he poured over them and became suspicious. He felt he was definitely looking at a crime scene. After I received the photograph, did the detailed examination, my initial reaction, something is wrong with this case. Some foul play took in place inside the van. From the photographs of the driver's side window, Lee could tell that the blood at the front of the van was spattered at medium velocity suggesting blunt force trauma. It appeared the victim was struck multiple times. The blood stains on the window also contradicted Matheson's assertion that his wife dived out of it. At the time of incident, this window was up. Approximately 200 medium velocity blood spatter was noticed in this area alone. Lee needed to see the van firsthand to trace the trajectory of the spatter. Strings were connected to each droplet to determine their common point of origin. It turned out to be the driver's seat area, about the height where a person's head would be. Lee's findings showed the damage was inflicted before she left the vehicle. The photos from the autopsy showed that the victim's head had sustained enough damage to kill her. Once Dr. Lee determined that a struggle had occurred in the van, investigators knew that Ken Matheson was lying. His motive for killing his wife was probably money. If she died in an accident, she would be paid $595,000, and if she died in an automobile-related accident, he would be paid $675,000. Sir, step out of the car. Put your hands up. Keep your hands where you can see them. Face down on the ground. Come on, over here in the ground. Face down. Move it. Face down. Based on the evidence, Ken Matheson was arrested on his day off. Police pieced together the murder. While Yvonne was driving, Ken Matheson struck her with a blunt object. She probably stopped the vehicle, or he gained control and brought it to a stop. He continued beating her to the brink of death. Marks on her hands suggested she had tried to defend herself. In the dark, Matheson probably didn't realize he was leaving the blood spatters that would be his undoing. Once he was sure that his wife wouldn't survive, he carried her out of the van and ran over her. He 
carried her back into the van and waited for someone to stop and call for help. We had, you know, a gut feeling and a lot of suspicions. We didn't have any hard evidence. So Dr. Lee's blood spatter analysis is what gave us our first piece of really hard evidence. In 1995, Ken Matheson was sentenced to life imprisonment for kidnapping and murder. He's not eligible for parole for 25 years. Sometimes a coroner's findings can only tell part of the story. When that happens, forensic criminalists like Dr. Lee give a voice to the victims who would otherwise be silenced forever. Victim gone. She cannot testify. Physical evidence speak for her. Matheson's simple but gruesome crime was undone by some forensic details that he just didn't count on. But can the same forensic science that proves murder also be used to prove that no murder was committed? Experts in New York State hoped it could. The town of Munsville in central New York is one of those quiet, picturesque places that blends unnoticed into the landscape as motorists rush past. In June 1990, it became an unlikely battleground for a most unlikely soldier. The trouble started in a shabby farmhouse outside of town. Delbert Ward, 59, awoke at dawn to milk his cows. He tried earlier to awaken his brother, William, but he didn't move. William hadn't been feeling well lately. Delbert thought it best to let him sleep. Delbert would take care of the chores without him today. The four Ward brothers were quiet and simple-minded. They'd spent their entire lives on the dairy farm. It was their universe, all they had and all they knew. Reclusive and childlike, the brothers even shared their bed, probably as they had done since boyhood. William, the oldest, was also the smartest and strongest. He ran the show. Delbert was his right-hand man. The other brothers, Roscoe and Lyman, occasionally pitched in to help out. But on this day, June 6th, Delbert was on his own. Even after he finished his chores, he couldn't wake Brother William. Something was wrong. Delbert called his brothers. The men didn't know what to do. Because the Ward brothers had no phone, Delbert and Roscoe walked to a neighbor's house to call for help. Their fourth brother, Lyman, watched after William until it arrived. 20 minutes after Delbert placed the call, state troopers and the Madison County coroner appeared at the farm. William's body was examined. No signs of foul play were noted. It seemed that 64-year-old William died peacefully in his sleep. His body was transported to the medical examiner's office while police interviewed the surviving brothers. In the following days, the brothers tried to get on with their work. It would be difficult without Brother Bill. Delbert's life would be much harder, and his troubles were just beginning. 
At Williams' autopsy, the assistant medical examiner took tissue samples and careful notes. No indicators of natural disease were noted in the report. However, something unusual demanded attention. Pinpoint size hemorrhages in Williams' eyes, mouth, and windpipe. These tiny spots, called petechial hemorrhages, can have a number of causes. Often, it's the first tip-off to death by suffocation. The assistant medical examiner couldn't rule out death by unnatural means. On the death certificate, cause of death was listed as pending further study. The district attorney was contacted and told the case was bothersome. And here's where communication apparently began to break down. The message was passed along to the state police, and the suspicions about the petechial hemorrhages became garbled along the way. Now, the possibility of homicide became a certainty. Delbert was taken to the station for questioning. He was interviewed for four hours. Isn't it true that you had something to do with him being sick? His interrogation was not recorded. According to attorney Ralph Cognetti in Albany, New York, Delbert was confused by all the attention. He only wanted to return to the farm, so he was soon willing to say anything. He signed the confession. Tell them what they want to hear and they'll let you go home. And that's in fact what they said to him. They certainly didn't let him go home after he confessed. But if you have an opportunity to read the confession, it really sounds like a Harvard dissertation. And you, you, you know, certainly, inside that that did not come from from Delbert's lips nevertheless the confession coupled with the autopsy results were enough to arrest Delbert later a grand jury handed up an indictment against him for second-degree murder to the people of Munsville population 400, it was absurd to think that Delbert would or could have killed his brother. They believed the state had it all wrong. When his bail was set at $10,000, the whole town chipped in and raised the money in a matter of hours. The kindness of the neighbors and the plight of Delbert Ward earned an article in the New York Times. The groundswell of support for Delbert began to grow. A friend of the wards brought Ralph Cognetti into the case. Based on his conversation with Delbert, Cognetti was convinced of his client's innocence. A review of the evidence suggested that the homicide charge was based more on Delbert's confession than on the physical evidence from the medical examiner's office. As Cognetti was putting his defense together, he received a fateful call. The man identified himself as Cyril Weck. The name meant nothing to Cognetti. Uh, here was a gentleman uh, who explained that he was a forensic pathologist uh, from Pittsburgh, and that he had read the article, read uh, the story about the boys, and was willing to review uh, whatever evidence we had right. without any cost okay, so to in us. In other words, what you're telling me is Dr. Cyril Wecht's reputation spreads far beyond the walls of the coroner's office in Pittsburgh, where he works as the chief forensic pathologist for Allegheny County. He's helped investigators on the assassination of Robert Kennedy and has consulted in the death of Elvis Presley. Besides degrees in medicine, Wecht also holds a degree in law. He'd read about the Delbert Ward case in the New York Times and it piqued his interest. He requested William Ward's case file. 
after I reviewed the case file, which included the autopsy report, my initial impression was that there was an inadequate basis for any forensic pathologist to conclude that this was an asphyxiation death from suffocation, smothering. There simply were not adequate findings for such a diagnosis. Using the assistant medical examiner's original notes, Wecht formulated a more mundane diagnosis. William Ward died of heart disease, the number one killer of men his age in America. The Ward brothers had in fact told authorities that William had been in poor health for years, but he refused to see a physician. His symptoms were consistent with cardiovascular disease, supporting Wecht's theory but the prosecution believed that William's illness may have provided a motive for his murder. Did Delbert Ward kill his brother William? The state of New York said he did. According to their theory, Delbert suffocated his brother to release him from his failing health. They said that it may have been a mercy killing, but it was murder nonetheless. The prosecution pointed to Delbert's odd behavior on the day of William's death. When Delbert couldn't rouse his brother at the crack of dawn like he normally did, he went about his chores anyhow. To the prosecution, that lack of concern suggested guilt. To Ralph Cognetti, it said more about the realities of life on a farm. It was a point that the prosecutor jumped on how could a person who was so concerned about his brother's well-being go and milk cows? Uh, what came out at trial, and what I'm sure the jurors knew, because we had one or two dairy farmers on the jury, was that if you don't milk a cow when it needs to be milked, then that cow's going to get very ill. Cognetti and Cyril Wecht stuck with the idea that William died of natural causes, but they had to prove it. The victim had already been buried. All Wecht had to work from were the autopsy records, those same records and tissue samples that the state claimed showed nothing unusual besides the petechial hemorrhages. That's not how Wecht read them. He was confident that he had everything he needed to prove Ward's innocence. According to the thin tissue samples gathered at William Ward's autopsy, along with the medical examiner's data, William's heart was enlarged and his coronary arteries suffered a blockage of 20%. His right lung was heavily scarred and weighed twice as much as his left. His liver and spleen also were enlarged. Without a drastic change in habits, death by heart disease seemed inevitable for William. But Wecht had to undermine the prosecution's assertion that he was murdered to be relieved of his suffering. Though Wecht had only photographs and tissue samples of William Ward to work from, he called upon his vast experience on other cases, where he had examined the bodies directly. He noted the petechiae the telltale red hemorrhages found in the victim's eyes and mouth. To the state, these were clear signs of strangling. They eclipsed all other symptoms. While it's true that petechial hemorrhages can indicate smothering, they're not enough to prove it beyond a doubt. Unless a person is somehow incapacitated before he's smothered, the body will likely show signs of a struggle William Ward's did not. No injuries around the mouth, in the mouth, in the tongue, the gums. No injuries on or around the neck. Uh, no evidence of increased fluidity of the blood. No evidence of increased blueness um, of the blood. And no aspiration of gastric contents that will occur as a person struggles. So we had none of it. For the defense, there was no evidence of murder. William simply died in his sleep of heart disease. The homicide charge was the result of an unfortunate series of miscommunications that had grown out of control. 
or you can take the incident seen by one person and then pass it on to a second and to a third. And then when you get down to the sixth or the tenth or the fifteenth, you'll find that that story bears very little relationship to the original uh, creation, to the original version. Coming into the case as an outsider, Weck was immune to the preconceptions that Delbert Ward was a murderer. By looking at the case with a fresh perspective, he won Delbert's freedom. On April 5, 1991, Delbert Ward was acquitted of all charges. It grew like a bomb almost. It started small, and then by the end of the trial, he became what he is today, really. A, uh, a legend, certainly in that part of the state. Cyril Wecht believes that the situation that Delbert Ward found himself in was not unusual. He's seen many cases that were tainted by a medical examiner's wrong assumptions, an investigator's speedy conclusion, or a simple misunderstanding. Unfortunately, these errors tend to compound themselves. We work closely and constantly with homicide detectives, with police, with district attorneys. We hear their versions. Consciously, subconsciously, those versions begin to take hold. And the mind then begins to work. And you build up then your own impressions, ultimately your own opinions and conclusions that fit in best with those. No matter how mysterious or suspicious a death may appear, the truth can be resurrected in the lab. Every day, the forensic skills of the medical examiner, coroner, and crime scene expert prove that the most important witness to a death is the deceased.